Part 9 of The Life and Death of Mr. Badman by John Bunyan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But was he not afraid of the judgments of God that did fly about at that time? He regarded not the judgment nor mercy of God, for had he at all done that, he could not have done as he did. But what judgments do you mean? Such judgments that, if Mr. Badman himself had taken but sober notice of, they might have made him hang down his ears. Why have you heard of any such persons that the judgments of God have overtaken? Yes, and so, I believe, have you too, though you make so strange about it. I have so indeed, to my astonishment and wonder. Pray, therefore, if you please, tell me what it is, as to this that you know, and then, perhaps, I may also say something to you of the same. In our town there was one W.S., a man of very wicked life, and he, when there seemed to be countenance given to it, would needs turn informer. Well, so he did, and was as diligent in his business as most of them could be. He would watch nights, climb trees, and range the woods a days, if possible, to find out the meters, for then they were forced to meet in the fields. Yea, he would curse them bitterly, and swear most fearfully what he would do to them when he found them. Well, after he had gone on like a bedlam in his course a while, and had done some mischiefs to the people, he was stricken by the hand of God, and that in this manner. One, although he had his tongue naturally at will, now he was taken with a faltering in his speech, and could not for weeks together speak otherwise than just like a man that was drunk. Two, then he was taken with a drooling or slabbering at his mouth, which slabber sometimes would hang at his mouth well nigh half way down to the ground. Three, then he had such a weakness in the back sinews of his neck that oft times he could not look up before him, unless he clapped his hand hard upon his forehead and held up his head that way by strength of hand. 4. After this his speech went quite away, and he could speak no more than a swine or a bear. Therefore, like one of them, he would gruntle and make an ugly noise, according as he was offended or pleased, or would have anything done, etc., in this posture he continued for a space of half a year, or thereabouts, all the while otherwise well, and could go about his business, save once that he had fall from the bell, as it hangs in our steeple, which t'was a wonder it did not kill him. But after that he also walked about, till God had made him a sufficient spectacle of his judgment for his sin, and then on a sudden he was stricken and died miserably, and so there was an end of him and his doings. I will tell you of another. About four miles from St. Neots, there was a gentleman had a man, and he would needs be an informer, and a lusty young man he was. Well, an informer he was, and did much distress some people, and had perfected his information so effectually against some, that there was nothing further to do, but for the constables to make distress on the people, that he might have the money or goods. And as I heard, he hastened them much to do it. Now while he was in the heat of his work, as he stood one day by the fireside, he had, it should seem, a mind to sop in the pan, for the spit was then not the fire. So he went to make him one. But behold, a dog, so say his own dog, took distaste at something, and bit his master by the leg. The which bite, notwithstanding all the means that was used to cure him, turned, as it was said, to a gangrene. However, that wound was his death and that a dreadful one too, for my relator said that he lay in such a condition by this bite, as the beginning, till his flesh rotted from off him before he went out of the world. But what need I instance in particular persons, when the judgment of God against this kind of people was made manifest? I think I may say, if not in all, yet in most of the counties in England where such poor creatures were. But I would, if it had been the will of God, that neither I nor anybody else could tell you more of these stories, true stories that are neither lie nor romance. Well, I also heard of both these myself, and of more too, as remarkable in their kind as these, if I had any list to tell them. But let us leave those that are behind to others, or to the coming of Christ, 
who then will justify or condemn them as the merit of their work shall require. Or, if they repented, and found mercy, I shall be glad when I know it, for I wish not a curse to the soul of mine enemy. There can be no pleasure in telling of such stories, though to hear of them may do us a pleasure. They may put us in mind that there is a God that judgeth on earth, and that doth not always forget nor defer to hear the cry of the destitute. They also carry along with them both caution and counsel to those that are survivors of such. Let us tremble at the judgment of God, and be afraid of sinning against him, and it shall be our protection. It shall go well with them that fear God, that fear before him. Well, sir, as you have intimated, so I think we have in this place spoken enough about these kind of men. If you please, let us return again to Mr. Badman himself, if you have any more to say of him. More! We have yet scarce thoroughly begun with anything that we have said. All the particulars are in themselves so full of badness that we have rather only looked in them than indeed said anything to them. But we will pass them and proceed. You have heard of the sins of his youth, of his apprenticeship, and how he set up and married, and what a life he hath led his wife. And now I will tell you some more of his pranks. He had the very knack of knavery. Had he, as I said before, been bound to serve an apprenticeship to all these things, he could not have been more cunning. He could not have been more artificial at it. Nor perhaps so artificially neither. For, as none can teach goodness like to God himself, so concerning sin and knavery, none can teach a man it like the devil, to whom, as I perceive, Mr. Badman went to school from his childhood to the end of his life. But pray, sir, make a beginning. Well, so I will. You may remember that I told you what a condition he was in for money before he did marry, and how he got a rich wife, with whose money he paid his debts. Now, when he had paid his debts, he having some money left, he set up against as briskly as ever, keeps a great shop, drives a great trade, and runs again a great way into debt. But now not into debt of one or two, but into the debt of many, so that at last he came to owe some thousands, and thus he went on a good while. And to pursue his ends the better, he began now to study to please all men, and to suit himself to any company. He could now be as they, say as they, that is, if he listed, and then he would list, when he perceived that by so doing he might either make them his customers or creditors for his commodities. If he dealt with the honest men, as with some honest men he did, then he would be as they, talk as they, seem to be sober as they, talk of justice and religion as they, and against debauchery as they, yea, and would too seem to show a dislike of them that said, did, or were otherwise than honest. Again, when he did light among those that were bad, then he would be as they, but yet more close and cautiously, except he were sure of his company. Then he would carry it openly, be as they, say damn em and sink em as they. If they railed on good men, so could he. If they railed on religion, so could he. If they talked beastly, vainly, idly, so would he. If they were for drinking, swearing, whoring, or any the like villainies, so was he. This was now the path he trod in, and could do all artificially as any man alive. And now he thought himself a perfect man. He thought he was always a boy till now. What think you now of Mr. Badman? Think? Why, I think he was an atheist. For no man but an atheist can do this. I say, it cannot be, but that the man that is such as this Mr. Badman must be a rank and stinking atheist. For he that believes that there is either God or devil, heaven or hell, or death and judgment after, cannot do as Mr. Badman did. I mean, if he could do these things without reluctancy and check of conscience, yea, if he had not sorrow and remorse for such abominable sins as these. Nay, he was so far off from reluctancies and remorse of conscience for these things, that he counted them 
the excellency of his attainments, the quintessence of his wit, his rare and singular virtues, such as but few besides him could be the masters of. Therefore, as for those that made boggle and stop at things, and that could not in conscience, and for fear of death and judgment, do such things as he, he would call them fools and naughties, and charge them for being frighted with the talk of unseen bugbears, and would encourage them, if they would be men indeed, to labor after the attainment of his excellent art. He would oftentimes please himself with the thoughts of what he could do in this matter, saying within himself, I can be religious and irreligious. I can be anything or nothing. I can swear and speak against swearing. I can lie and speak against lying. I can drink, wench, be unclean, and defraud, and not be troubled for it. Now I enjoy myself, and am master of mine own ways, and not they of me. This I have attained with much study, great care, and more pains. But this his talk should be only with himself, to his wife, who he knew durst not divulge it, or among his intimates, to whom he knew he might say anything. Did I call him before an atheist? I may call him now a devil, or a man possessed with one, if not with many. I think that there cannot be found in every corner such an one as this. True, it is said of King Ahaz that he sinned more and more, and of Ahab that he sold himself to work wickedness, and of the men of Sodom, that they were sinners exceedingly before the Lord. An atheist he was, no doubt, if there be such a thing as an atheist in the world. But for all his brags of perfection and security in his wickedness, I believe that at times God did let down fire from heaven into his conscience. True, I believe he would quickly put it out again, and grow more desperate and wicked afterward, but this also turned to his destruction, as afterward you may hear. But I am not of your mind to think that there was but few such in the world, except as you mean as to the degree of wickedness unto which he had attained. For otherwise, no doubt, there is abundance of such as he, men of the same mind, of the same principles, and of the same conscience, too, to put them into practice. Yea, I believe that there are many that are endeavoring to attain to the same pitch of wickedness, and all of them are such as he in the judgment of the law, nor will their want of hellish wit to attain thereto excuse them at the day of judgment. You know that in all science some are more arch than some, and so it is in the art as well as in the practice of wickedness. Some are twofold and some are sevenfold more the children of hell than others and yet all the children of hell, else they would be the masters, and none scholars in the school of wickedness. But there must be masters, and there must be learners. Mr. Badman was a master in this art, and therefore it follows that he must be an arch and chief one in that mystery. You are in the right, for I perceive that some men, though they desire it, cannot be so arch in the practice thereof as others, but are as I suppose they call them, fools and dunces to the rest. Their heads and capacities will not serve them to act and do so wickedly. But Mr. Badman wanted not a wicked head to contrive, as well as a wicked heart to do his wickedness. True, but yet I say such men shall at the day of judgment be judged not only for what they are, but also for what they would be. For if the thought of foolishness is sin, Doubtless the desire of foolishness is more sin. And if the desire be more, the endeavor after it must needs be more and more. He then that is not an artificial, atheist and transgressor, yet if he desires to be so, if he endeavoreth to be so, he shall be judged and condemned to hell for such an one. For the law judgeth men, as I say, according to what they would be. He that looketh upon a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. By the same rule, he that would steal, doth steal. He that would cheat, doth cheat. He that would swear, doth swear. And he that would commit adultery, doth do so. For God judgeth men according to the workings of their minds, and saith, As he thinketh, so is he. That is, so is he in his heart, in his intentions, in his desires, in his endeavors. And God's law, I say, 
lays hold of the desires, intentions, and endeavors, even as it lays hold of the act of wickedness itself. A man, then, that desires to be as bad as Mr. Batman, and desire to be so wicked, have many in their hearts, though he never attains to that proficiency in wickedness as he, shall yet be judged for as bad a man as he, because twas in his desires to be such a wicked one. But this height of wickedness in Mr. Badman will not yet out of my mind. This hard, desperate, or what shall I call it, diabolical frame of heart was in him a foundation, a groundwork to all acts and deeds that were evil. The heart and the desperate wickedness of it is the foundation and groundwork of all. Atheism, professed and practical, spring both out of the heart, yea, all the manner of evils besides. For they be not bad deeds that make a bad man, but he already a bad man that doth bad deeds. A man must be wicked before he can do wickedness. Wickedness proceedeth from the wicked. Tis an evil tree that bears evil fruit. Then gather no grapes of thorns. The heart, therefore, must be evil before the man can do evil, and good before the man doth good. Now I see the reason why Mr. Badman was so base as to get a wife by dissimulation, and to abuse her so like a villain when he had got her. It was because he was before by a wicked heart prepared to act wickedness. You may be sure of it. For from within, out the heart of man proceedeth evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile a man. And a man, as his naughty mind inclines him, makes use of these, or any of these, to gratify his lust, to promote his designs, to revenge his malice, to enrich or to wallow himself in the foolish pleasures and pastimes of this life. And all these did Mr. Badman do, even to the utmost, if either opportunity or purse or perfidiousness would help him to the obtaining of his purpose. Purse? Why, he could not but have purse to do almost what he would, having married a wife with so much money. Hold you there. Some of Mr. Badman's sins were costly, as his drinking and whoring, and keeping other bad company, though he was a man that had ways too many to get money, as well as ways too many to spend it. End of Part 9「Part Ten of the Life and Death of Mr. Badman by John Bunyan. This sleep of Ox recording is in the public domain. Had he then such a good trade for all he was such a bad man, or was his calling so gainful to him as always to keep his purse's belly full, though he was himself a great spender? No, it was not his trade that did it, though he had a pretty trade too. He had another way to get money and that by hatfuls and pocketfuls at a time. Why, I trow he was no highwayman, was he? I will be spared in my speeches to that, though some have muttered as if he could ride out now and then, about nobody but himself knew what, overnight, and come home all dirty and weary next morning. But that is not the thing I aim at. Pray let me know it, if you think it convenient that I should. I will tell you. It was this. He had an art to break and get hatfuls of money by breaking. But what do you mean by Mr. Badman's breaking? You speak mystically, do you not? No, I speak plainly. Or if you will have it in plainer language, tis this. When Mr. Badman had swaggered and whored away most of his wife's portion, he began to feel that he could not much longer stand upon his legs in this course of life, and keep up his trade and repute, such as he had, in the world, but by the new engine of breaking. Wherefore, upon a time, he gives a great and sudden rush into several men's debts, to the value of about four or five thousand pound, driving at the same time a very great trade, by selling many things for less than they cost him, to get him custom, therewith to blind his creditor's eyes. 
His creditors, therefore, feeling that he had a great employ, and dreaming that it must needs at length turn to a very good account to them, trusted him freely without mistrust, and so did others too, to the value of what was mentioned before. Well, when Mr. Badman had well feathered his nest with other men's goods and money, after a little time he breaks, and by and by it is noised abroad that Mr. Badman had shut up shop, was gone and could trade no longer. Now by that time his breaking was come to his creditor's ears. He had by craft and knavery made so sure of what he had that his creditors could not touch a penny. Well, when he had done, he sends his mournful sugared letters to his creditors to let them understand what had happened unto him, and desired them not to be severe with him, for he bore towards all men an honest mind and would pay so far as he was able. Now he sends his letters by a man confederate with him, who could make both the worst and best of Mr. Badman's case, the best for Mr. Badman and the worst for his creditors. So when he comes to them, he both bemoans them and condoles Mr. Badman's condition, telling them that without a speedy bringing of things to a conclusion, Mr. Badman would be able to make them no satisfaction, but at present he both could and would, and that to the utmost of his power, and to that end, he desired that they would come over to him. Well, his creditors appoint him a time, and come over, and he, meanwhile, authorize another to treat with them, but will not be seen himself, unless it was on a Sunday, lest they should snap him with a writ. So his deputed friend treats with them about their concern with Mr. Badman, first telling them of the great care that Mr. Badman took to satisfy them and all men for whatsoever he ought, as far as in him lay, and how little he thought a while since to be in this low condition. He pleaded also the greatness of his charge, the greatness of taxes, the badness of the times, and the great losses that he had by many of his customers, some of which died in his debt, others were run away, and for many that were alive he never expected a farthing from them. Yet nevertheless he would show himself an honest man, and would pay as far as he was able, and if they were willing to come to terms, he would make a composition with them, for he was not able to pay them all. The creditors asked what he would give. T'was replied, half a crown in the pound. At this they began to huff, and he to renew his complaint and entreaty. But the creditors would not hear, and so for that time their meeting without success broke up. But after his creditors were in cool blood, and admitting of second thoughts, and fearing lest delays should make them lose all, they admit of a second debate, come together again, and by many words and great ado, they obtained five shillings the pound. So the money was produced. Releases and discharges drawn, signed and sealed. Books crossed and all things confirmed, and then Mr. Badman can put his head out of doors again, and be a better man than when he shut up shop, by several thousands of pounds. And did he do thus indeed? Yes, once and again. I think he break twice, or thrice. And did he do it before he had need to do it? Need? What do you mean by need? There is no need at any time for a man to play the knave. He did it of a wicked mind, to defraud and beguile his creditors. He had wherewithal of his father, and also by his wife, to have lived upon, with lawful labor, like an honest man. He had also, when he made this wicked break, though he had been a profuse and prodigal spender, to have paid his creditors their own to a farthing. But had he done so, he had not done like himself, like Mr. Badman. Had he, I say, dealt like an honest man, he had then gone out of Mr. Badman's road. He did it, therefore, of a dishonest mind, and to a wicked end, to wit that he might have wherewithal, howsoever unlawfully gotten, to follow his cups and queens, and to live in the full swing of his lusts, even as he did before. Why, this was a mere cheat. It was a cheat indeed. This way of breaking, it is else but a more neat way of thieving, of picking of pockets, of breaking open of shops, and of taking from men what one has nothing to do with. But though it seems easy, it is hard to learn. 
no man that has conscience to god or man can ever be his craft's master in this hellish art oh sir what a wicked man was this a wicked man indeed by this art he could tell how to make men send their goods to his shop and then be glad to take a penny for that for which he had promised before it came thither to give them a groat i say he could make them glad to take a crown for a pound's worth and a thousand for that for which he had promised before to give them four thousand pounds this argueth that mr badman had but little conscience this argued that mr badman had no conscience at all for conscience the least spark of a good conscience cannot endure this before we go any further in mr badman's matters let me desire you if you please to give me an answer to these two questions one what do you find in the word of god against such a practice as this of Mr. Badman's is. 2. What would you have a man do that is in his creditor's debt and can neither pay him what he owes him nor go on in a trade any longer? I will answer you as well as I can. And first to the first of your questions, to wit, what I find in the word of God against such a practice as this of Mr. Badman's is. Answer. The word of God doth forbid this wickedness, and to make it the more odious in our eyes, it joins it with theft and robbery. Thou shalt not, says God, defraud thy neighbor, nor rob him. Thou shalt not defraud, that is, deceive or beguile. Now thus to break is to defraud, deceive, and beguile, which is, as you see, forbidden by the God of heaven. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, nor rob him. It is a kind of theft and robbery, thus to defraud and beguile. It is a wily robbing of his shop, and picking of his pocket, a thing odious to reason and conscience, and contrary to the law of nature. It is a designed piece of wickedness, and therefore a double sin. A man cannot do this great wickedness on a sudden, and through a violent assault of Satan. He that will commit this sin must have time to deliberate, that by invention he may make it formidable, and that with lies and high dissimulations. He that commits this wickedness must first hatch it upon his bed, beat his head about it, and lay his plot strong, so that to the completing of such a wickedness there must be adjoined many sins, and they too must go hand in hand until it be completed. But what saith the Scriptures? Let no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. But this kind of breaking is a going beyond my brother. This is a compassing of him about that I may catch him in my net, and, as I said, an art to rob my brother, and to pick his pocket, and that with his consent. Which doth not therefore mitigate, but so much the more greater, and make odious the offence. For men that are thus wildly abused cannot help themselves. They are taken in a deceitful net. But God will here concern himself. He will be the avenger. He will be the avenger of all such either here or in another world. And this the apostle testifies again, where he saith, But he that doth wrong shall receive for the wrong that he hath done, and there is no respect to persons. That is, there is no man, be he what he will, if he will be guilty of this sin, of going beyond, of beguiling of, and doing wrong to his brother, but God will call him to an account for it, and will pay him with vengeance for it too, for there is no respect of persons. I might add that this sin of wronging, of going beyond, and defrauding of my neighbor, it is like that first prank that the devil played with our first parents, as the altar that Uriah built for Ahaz, was taken from the fashion of that that stood at Damascus to be the very pattern of it. The serpent beguiled me, says Eve. Mr. Badman beguiles his creditors. The serpent beguiled Eve with lying promises of gain, and so did Mr. Badman beguile his creditors. The serpent said one thing and meant another when he beguiled Eve, and so did Mr. Badman when he beguiled his creditors. That man, therefore, that doth thus deceive and beguile his neighbor, imitateth the devil. He taketh his examples from him, and not from God. 
the word are good men. And this did Mr. Badman. And now to your second question, to wit, what I would have a man do that is in his creditor's debt, and that can neither pay him nor go on in a trade any longer. Answer. First of all, if this be the case, and he knows it, let him not run one penny further in his creditor's debt, for that cannot be done with good conscience. He that knows he cannot pay, and yet will run into debt, does knowingly wrong and defraud his neighbor, and falls under that sentence of the word of God. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. Yea, worse, he borrows, though at the very same time he knows that he cannot pay again. He doth also craftily take away what is his neighbor's. That is therefore the first thing that I would propound to such. Let him not run any further into his creditor's debt. Secondly, after this let him consider how and by what means he was brought into such a condition that he could not pay his just debts. To wit, whether it was by his own remissness in his calling, by living too high in diet or apparel, by lending too ravishly that which was none of his own to his loss, or whether by the immediate hand and judgment of God. If by searching he finds that this is come upon him through remisses of his calling, extravagances in his family, or the like, let him labor for a sense of his sin and wickedness, for he has sinned against the Lord, first in his being slothful in business, and in not providing to wit of his own, by the sweat of his brows, or other honest ways, for those of his own house, and secondly in being lavishing in diet and apparel in the family, or in lending to others that which was none of his own. This cannot be done with good conscience. It is both against reason and nature, and therefore must be a sin against God. I say, therefore, if thus this debtor hath done, if ever he would live quietly in conscience and comfortably in his condition for the future, let him humble himself before God and repent of this his wickedness. For he that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. To be slothful and a waster too is to be, as it were, a double sinner." But again, as this man should inquire into these things, so he should also into this. How came I into this way of dealing in which I have now miscarried? Is it a way that my parents brought me up in, put me an apprentice to, or that by providence I was first thrust into? Or is it a way into which I have twisted myself, as not being contented with my first lot, that by God and my parents I was cast into? This ought duly to be considered, and if upon search a man shall find that he is out of the place and calling into which he was put by his parents, or the providence of God, and has miscarried in a new way, that through pride and dislike of his first state he has chose rather to embrace, his miscarriage is his sin, the fruit of his pride, and a token of the judgment of God, upon him for his leaving of his first state." And for this he ought, as for the former, be humble and penitent before the Lord. But if by search he finds that his poverty came by none of these, if by honest search he finds it so, and can say with good conscience, I went not out of my place and state in which God by his providence had put me, but have abode with God in the calling wherein I was called, and have wrought hard and fared meanly, been civilly apparelled, and have not directly nor indirectly made away with my creditor's goods. Then has his fall come upon him by the immediate hand of God, whether by visible or invisible ways. For sometimes it comes by visible ways, to wit, by fire, by thieves, by loss of cattle, or the wickedness of sinful dealers, etc., and sometimes by means invisible, and then no man knows how. We only see things are going, but cannot see by what way they go. Well, now suppose that a man, by an immediate hand of God, is brought to a morsel of bread. What must he do now? I answer, his surest way is still to think that this is the fruit of some sin, though possibly not sin in the management of his calling, yet of some other sin. God casteth away the substance of the wicked. Therefore let him still humble himself before God, because his hand is upon him, and say, What sin is this for which this hand of God is upon me? And let him be diligent to find it out. 
for some sin is the cause of this judgment. For God doth not willingly afflict nor grieve the children of men. Either the heart is too much set upon the world, or religion is too much neglected in the family, or some thing. There is a snake in the grass, a worm in the gourd, some sin in thy bosom, for the sake of which God doth thus deal with thee. Thirdly, this thus done, let that man again consider thus with himself. Perhaps God is now changing of my condition and state in the world. He has let me live in fashion, in fullness, and abundance of worldly glory, and I did not to his glory improve, as I should, that his good dispensation to me. But when I lived in full and fat pasture, I did there lift up the heel. Therefore he will now turn me into hard commons, and with leanness and hunger and meanness, and want. I may spend the rest of my days. But let him do thus without murmuring and repining. Let him do it in a godly manner, submitting himself to the judgment of God. Let the rich rejoice in that he is made low. This is duty, and it may be a privilege to those that are under the hand of God, and for thy encouragement to this hard work. For this is a hard work. Consider of these four things. 1. This is right lying down under God's hand, and the way to be exalted in God's time. When God would have Job embrace the dunghill, he embraces it and says, The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 2. Consider that there are blessings also that attend a low condition, more than all the world are aware of. A poor condition has preventing mercy attending of it. The poor, because they are poor, are not capable of sinning against God as the rich man does. 3. The poor can more clearly see himself preserved by the providence of God than the rich, for he trusteth in the abundance of his riches. 4. It may be God has made thee poor, because he would make thee rich. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which God hath promised to them that love him. I am persuaded if men upon whom this hand of God is would thus quietly lie down and humble themselves under it, they would find more peace, yea, more blessing of God attending them in it, than the most of men are aware of. But this is an hard chapter, and therefore I do not expect that many should either read it with pleasure or desire to take my counsel. Having thus spoken to the broken man with reference to his own self, I will now speak to him as he stands related to his creditors. In the next place, therefore, let him fall upon the most honest way of dealing with his creditors, and that I think must be this. First, let him timely make them acquainted with his condition, and also to do them these three things. 1. Let him heartily and unfeignedly Ask them forgiveness for the wrong that he has done them. 2. Let him proffer them all, and the whole all that ever he has in the world. Let him hide nothing. Let him strip himself to his raiment for them. Let him not keep a ring, a spoon, or anything from them. 3. If none of these two will satisfy them, let him proffer them his body, to be at their disposal to wit, either to abide imprisonment their pleasure, or to be at their surface, till by labor and travel he hath made them such amends as they in reason think fit, only reserving something for the succor of his poor and distressed family out of his labor, which in reason and conscience and nature he is bound also to take care of. Thus shall he make them what amends he is able for the wrong that he hath done them in wasting and spending of their estates. By thus doing he submits himself to God's rod, commits himself to the dispose of his providence. Yea, by thus doing, he casteth the lot of his present and future condition into the lap of his creditors, and leaves the whole disposed thereof to the Lord, even as he shall order and incline their hearts to do with him. And let that be either to forgive him, or to take that which he hath for satisfaction, or to lay his body under affliction, this way or that, according to the law, can he, I say, thus leave the whole disposed to God, let the issue be what it will, that man shall have peace in his mind afterward, and the comforts of that state, which will be the comforts that attend equity, justice, and duty, will be more unto him, because more according to godliness, 
than can be the comforts that are the fruits of injustice, fraudulency, and deceit. Besides, this is the way to engage God to favor him by the sentence of his creditors, for he can entreat them to use him kindly, and he will do it when his ways are pleasing in his sight. When a man's ways please the Lord, his enemy shall be at peace with him, and surely for a man to seek to make restitution for wrong done to the utmost of his power by what he is, has, and enjoys in this world is the best way in that capacity, and with reference to that thing that a man can at this time be found active in. But he that doth otherwise abides in his sin, refuses to be disposed of by the providence of God, chooseth an high estate, though not attained in God's way, when God's will is that he should descend into a low one. Yea, he desperately saith in his heart and actions, I will be mine own chooser, and that in mine own way, whatever happens or follows thereupon. End of part 10